throughout October and November, we've talked about the I Am sayings of Jesus and the Gospel of John. And each time I've sort of set it up for you, surely you've heard this on one level or another um, many times. Critical, these sayings, because they say who Jesus is. We do a lot of work. We say a lot of things about who Jesus is based on our own understanding. The United Methodist tradition has four segments that should inform our thinking, our speaking, and our uh, doing. It's called the quadrilateral, and it, it summarizes John Wesley's thoughts, the founder of our faith. And he talked about four distinct things that help us determine what we should do. The first one is Scripture. Scripture is the primary one. It has a greater share of the pie than all the other ones uh, combined. Good 51% voting share, if not 60. Scripture should be the primary focus of guiding us as to what we are to think, say, and do. Another phase of it is tradition. What is the history of intelligent people, theological people, thoughtful people throughout time since there has been Scripture, what's their interpretation of it? Because it's great to study not only what we believe, but what have people believed and said about this text for a long, long time. Another phase of it is reason. Our ability to think. To place it in our hands to have um, this text to know that we're not only supposed to look at this text, but we're supposed to look at outside the text in various ways. We're supposed to understand our life and what's going on, and we're supposed to be able to process it. The last one being experience. What have we seen in our own life? Experience should have 15 to 20% share. Unfortunately, what we do most of the time is experience is about 90% of it. What we've seen what we've heard, what we've said. Reason gets 5%, I and mean, we think, how much do you know about what the church fathers have said about Scripture? How much do ministers, a couple years after seminary, we struggle if you don't stay on, if you don't keep reading what they've said, and then Scripture itself? So paying attention to what Scripture says and what it means is one of our primary focuses. And it should be the major part of what informs our decision making. And so, the I am statements, which can only be found in John. John thought it was really important. They tie back to the Old Testament. And they say exactly who Jesus is. We don't have to think real hard. So let's review them quickly. The ones that we've seen since October until today. Number one, the bread of life. I remember vividly when I talked about this, I said, uh, it did not say... I am the lobster of life. I am the five-star restaurant of life. Bread and fancy. But it gets you through the day. It's something that is truly critical. I talked about how we've watched um, Survivor on Hulu. We've watched all the seasons going uh, uh, from season one all the way up till um, we're in about 2008 now on Hulu. And those people who are struggling each and every day just to make it to the next day, rice is a real big deal. Bread is a real big deal. The people that we help so frequently uh, in, in local, regional, and global missions, bread is real simple. And bread is real critical. He says, I am the bread of life each and every day. The next one, I'm the light of the world. You walk into a dark room that you don't necessarily know and you understand how critical this is. I am the light of the world. I shed light, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. There's plenty of times when we think, you know what, I wish it sort of stay dark, so I don't, I don't want anybody paying attention to this. I don't want anybody seeing this. But Jesus' actions and His words shed light upon those who were doing amazing things and those who were doing real dark things as well. The next one, I'm the door. Also has a double meaning. I am the way that you walk in. I am the protection of those who want to harm. You think about those times when you've locked your door, how secure you feel from people on the other side of it. There's a security to it, 
and there's an entrance. I am the way to get in. All these things Jesus is emphasizing along a certain period of time. The next one. A good shepherd. What does a bad shepherd do? A bad shepherd collects a paycheck, and if a bear comes along, I'm out. If a wolf comes along, that's it. I'm done. The good shepherd stays with the sheep. It's not about the shepherd. It's about the sacrifice for the sheep, no matter what happens. Figure Jesus lived that out. He went right into the heart of it, Jerusalem. He knew what people were going to do. He went right for them and sacrificed Himself for them. The good shepherd not only protects the sheep on sunny, easy days, but protects the sheep when it's dark and the wolf is coming. I'm the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life. This is really important. Because we believe not only in the um, afterlife, we will be resurrected, we'll be in the heavenly kingdom, but we have all kinds of you know, use images, he uses metaphors all the time of when you are broken, when you are lost, when you figure you got no chance, this is it, no opportunity, and you feel pretty young to have no opportunity left, Jesus is offering them an opportunity. When they, Jesus asked them to truly sacrifice, especially from that image before of the Good Shepherd, and it may cost them their life, it's important to tell him, tell them, I'm going to be with you. How about the next one? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the path that you should take. Not a fixed path, like a railroad track where you have no other options. I really wish you could walk with me. I really wish you could listen to this truth. Because if, I don't know if you've been in, um, there's times around the kitchen table, there's times in the boardroom, there's times in the church when people are debating back and forth, we've been going a good 17, 21, 35 minutes on a subject, and then somebody says something the truth, you can't argue with it. You might not like it, and there's plenty of people in that moment that will just start saying things because they don't like the truth, but you just can't argue with it. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Think about all those images. All those times Jesus says, I am, which I've told you each time the I am ties back to the Old Testament when they use that word to describe God because they wouldn't say the word God because they didn't want to uh, be disrespectful. And then we have today. I am the vine. Now, I don't know how many of you are uh, gardeners. Um, I've never gardened a day in my life. I've watered a couple plants that were given to me for a certain amount of time. And uh, they were on life support. And it didn't succeed. There's some, I've, you know, looking at... Uh, research about gardening, about um, pruning vines, it regularly says you need to take what percentage out? 10%? 20? 30? 50? 70? 80? It says cut it 90% back. He said you can never make a mistake. It's always going to come back. He says, cut it 90% back and leave three buds. That's the way to do it. And if it doesn't work, cut 90% out again. My goodness, if you're that vine. So, um, the fill in the blanks today, uh, I remember I've done lines before. And people say, you can't call it fill in the blanks, it's just lines. It's just lines. So, the lines today uh, come together to make a prayer. So, here's the first line of the prayer. Dear Lord, keep me focused can't imagine how hard that is. Um, great leaders in uh, the military, in church life, and uh, uh, CEOs and strategy, when they, are, when they are negotiating, they say, no plan survives contact with the enemy. No plan survives contact with the enemy, meaning, well, we got a pretty decent idea of what they got going on over there. So we're going to make a plan over here We've got a strategy. We're going to sell the strategy. We're going to make sure you understand it. Then we're going to send you out. Well, when you send them out, there are uh, other people who have a plan based on you. And they have a strategy. And they know it very well. And they're coming towards you. Of course, then there's the environment that you don't know. 
understanding that when you actually go out and you actually make contact, it's going to be much harder. It's one of the great aspects of leadership, one of the great aspects of building a plan. Um, I don't know how many of you are involved in coaching with basketball. Basketball started this past Saturday, yesterday. And if you are a player on a team, make sure you come to church. You've got to come to church as part of your participation in basketball in order to participate. But sitting around with seven and eight year old girls and telling them this is what we're going to do when we get on the court and being able in practice to stand there right with them and correct them and put them in the exact spot and then on Saturday having to stand over here behind this line and just uh, I hope you all do what we talked about. Good luck. Dear Lord, keep me focused. Making sure that they understand the things that we talked about and having keys and communicating and giving them signs, this is what we're going to do. I was astonished yesterday at how much they did of what we practiced. And then, of course, I would say to them, uh, I'm yelling, but I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling because it's loud and because you're halfway across the court and because the parents are cheering and because whatever. I'm not screaming at you, seven-year-old girl. I'm yelling instructions for you to pay attention. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. But Lord, keep me focused. What are the things that draw me away from that focus? We come here, we talk about the Scripture, we sing the songs, we pay attention, and we go out there, and there's bills. We go out there, and there's co-workers. We go out there, and there's family. Family's coming to town this week. You are going somewhere else this week. They're going to have some things to say. They are going to be insecure. And the way they're going to deal with that insecurity is they are going to say something negative about someone else, or themselves, or you. And um, I know this because I've lived it. When someone tells you a story about someone doing that, you are patient. You say, well, maybe, you maybe this is what they meant. Well, maybe you should do this. But when you're the person, and especially if you are anticipating that that person's going to say that, as they're driving to you or as you are driving to them, your patience dries up. If you were to say to yourself, and this is Thanksgiving with families, one of the greatest tests, Lord, keep me focused on the things you would have me to say. Keep me focused on all those things that you said you were. That is the beginning of our prayer for the day. So the scripture for today starts John 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. If you look throughout the Gospels, and Jesus tells parables, especially close to the end, the person starts a vineyard, and then they do what? They have to leave. Now, sometimes that's, uh, it, it exhibits very negative behavior. Sometimes it's not directly tied to God. But to say, I'm going to create, but I'm not going to control, is one of the amazing aspects of God. God granting free will to creation that He made is amazing. He says, I'm the true vine. That means you're going to have to pick. You know, those movies where um, uh, the bomb's ticking down. I haven't seen one lately. The bomb's ticking down, and there's a red wire, there's a blue wire, there's a green wire, there's a yellow wire. And what do they have to do? They've got to pick the right one. So he says, I'm the true vine. That means there are more to choose from. That means it's going to be difficult to know which one you should choose. Jesus wants to make sure that people know that. So the, uh, the Scripture continues. He removes any of my branches that don't produce fruit... And He trims any branch that produces fruit so that it will produce even more fruit. You ever say to yourself or to a loved one, you know, I think what I did was pretty good. I, I think people ought to just be happy with that. I don't know why people are questioning it. I don't know why people want me to do more. I think what I did was pretty good. Both parts of you are getting trimmed as this Scripture describes Anything that's taken away from what God wants you to do, if you pray for it, it's going to be taken away. It's going to be painful. Because the reason you do that thing is it comforts you. 
The reason you eat that thing, the reason you buy that thing, the reason you drink that thing, uh, the reason you say that thing, the reason you watch that thing, is because they comfort you and help you with the pain that you're feeling. The thing he's asking in this scripture is for you to know that thing and to pray for it to be gone, which will not only cause more pain, but give you less comfort because it's the thing that comforts you. Isn't that hard? He says, also, the thing you did pretty well, I'm going to turn that back too. Jesus is giving them very clear instructions that the things that they are doing are going to cause them pain. Now, on the one hand, you can see that as a negative. On the other hand, I want you to see that as a positive because so many people say, I don't know why this has to be so, what? Hard. Why does this have to be so hard? I'm trying to do what Jesus wants. Why is this so hard? Hello? Because it's painful. Not only the things that are taken away from you, but the things that you need to do. So, on the one hand, you could say, Joe said, no matter what, it's going to be painful. <laughs> on the other hand, you could say, pain is not an indication that I'm doing it the wrong way. Pain is not an indication that God is not with me. In fact, pain may be an indication that I'm doing it the right way and He is with me. Second part of your prayer. Remove anything that does not produce fruit. I do some stuff that doesn't produce any fruit. I watch shows over and over again. Sometimes I stare blankly. Sometimes I hear people say negative things and don't stop it. Sometimes I say negative things. Okay? Sometimes I know it. I know that Katie needs help with the kids. Sometimes I know that they need something and I think, Ugh. just tired. Just tired. Yep, that baby is crying, but that may just be a dream. Maybe I should just roll over. Maybe it'll just work itself out. You just cry yourself back to sleep. There's plenty of times I do the right thing, but there's plenty of times when I do not produce fruit. He's saying, remove anything that does not produce fruit. Scripture continues. You are already trimmed because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. You remember how the people responded to what Jesus said, especially the religious leadership? The word of the day is hostile. They were entirely hostile to what He said, His interpretation of Scripture, and what He cut out from what they thought was significant. That caused them significant pain. They did not care for it. They wanted Him gone. You are already trimmed, Jesus says, right now. We're starting, we are all starting on the right foot. You're all 10% of what you were with three buds. Remain in Me, and I will remain in you. Again, granting free will. Scripture continues. A branch can't produce fruit by itself, but must remain in the vine. Likewise, you can't produce fruit unless you remain in me. My goodness, I'm going into my 15th year in ministry. I've struggled with this one. There's been times when I have said, I'm just going to do it. Well, should we pray about it? Well, I mean, we could. Let's just go do it. Well, should we talk to more people about it and let's collaborate and let's make sure we get uh, uh, 500 people all on the same page? Well, we could. Um, but this situation is really, really bad right now. It's bad. And the longer it's bad, the more it's going to be in my nightmares. The more it's in my nightmares, the less I'm going to sleep. The less I sleep, the less I want to deal with it. Let's just go ahead and what? Let's do something. But if you don't remain in me, your lay leader is a, um, in any United Methodist Church is a person who represents you at every significant meeting. And your lay leader is Janice Holliday. And if you don't know about Janice Holliday, you can summarize her in uh, um, <laughs> two words. Three words. <laughs> Y'all might need a sentence. Uh, she is fired up, and she is prayerful. She says, let's pray about it. Let's slow down. Let's expect that God is going to do amazing things. Let's know that we cannot produce anything unless God is with us and God is in it. 
she has been a total blessing to me and will impact me um, the rest of the way. The last part of the prayer. And help me consistently produce fruit for you. Help me consistently produce fruit for whom? For you. Let me give you the credit. Now this is something that John does which is unique to his gospel. I want you to notice how he repeats it again and again. Watch this. Uh, Scripture continues. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. If you don't remain in me, you will be like a branch that is thrown out and dries up. These branches are gathered up, thrown in a fire, and burned. See how people use that um, to really scare people? To really intimidate people? To get them to avoid hell? Ah. He's really saying is you're just not much help. All these branches that you've gotten up, you've thrown to the curb that just aren't much help? He's saying that's basically what you are. If you remain in me, if you pay attention, if you remain focused and want to do something, you will produce fruit for me. You will do something truly amazing. So I hope you paid attention. I hope you noticed things during the I Am series. I hope you know a little bit more about what Jesus was. I know you are in church. I know you're in Sunday school. I know you read books. But hearing it is entirely significant each and every time. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, it is by Your mercy that we are gathered here and we are entirely grateful. It's by Your Son's wisdom, by His purpose, by His dedication that we are here. You know that in granting us free will we may lose focus. You know that we may take Your name in vain. We know that we may take Your words bend them to what we want, do whatever we want, and say it's in Your name. You know that we will do that, and yet You still grant us free will. Help us, Lord, in this freedom, in this space that You've given us, to understand why Jesus came, why He said what He said, why He did what He did, what He believed, how we can live in that life, how we can, understanding our weakness, also understand your strength. While we can understand the freedom that you've given us, understand the call that you've given us as well. Not only to say, do whatever you want, come here and be forgiven, but I am giving you this tremendous gift, this opportunity, this chance to succeed. I am trusting you as you leave this place to be in me. Amen.